Winging It is a show by Adbird about web design, development, and our approach to solving problems. I'm James, and on today's show, our backend expert, Ed, will talk with David and I about FastAPI. To start us off, Ed, for folks like me who are just getting into this, can you explain what exactly FastAPI is? Sure. Um, so FastAPI, uh, it's a framework for writing web applications in Python. Um, so it's an alternative to tools like Django um, or pretty much any other uh, backend uh, framework for any other language, right? And I think the name highlights two important things about it. One, that it's fast. It's, at least in the Python side of things, it's one of the fastest uh, frameworks when it comes to running your application code in the server. But I think especially to me, it means it's fast also uh, to write your, your application in. Um, and we'll see why in a, in a bit. Uh, and then the other part of the name, the API, it's because it's really focused on just APIs. Uh, so you can think of just reading and writing JSON over the network instead of uh, full HTML sites. Even though it can be, it can do a little bit of that. Its focus is definitely on uh, using, you know, uh, JSON as input and output for those APIs. So there's a lot of tools in this space. What what uh, captures your attention, or why do you like Fast API? Yeah. So the main thing I would think is uh, how it it's really leveraging the usage of Python uh, type hints. So let me start my my uh, screen here and so that we can see uh, a little demo that I have. So I have a, a small fast API uh, application here. This is actually all the code you need uh, for a completely working endpoint. Um, and you can see very easily that we just instantiate a new fast api app and then with this decorator you can define the method that the endpoint's gonna accept and then you just define any url parameters that you want to have and your function uh accepts those parameters and then returns whatever you want to send to the to the uh, client uh, but what's there's a bunch of, of frameworks that work like this but one of the things that i like is if you see the type hint here telling it that the item ID is an integer, that's actual an actual Python language feature, but uh, most frameworks will, this is just this would just be for your own developer experience, knowing that if you were to ever call the function internally, you should pass an integer. But actually FastAPI, if I uh, just send a request here, well, I can see first of all that it works if I just say items slash one, I get back the same item that I sent and you can see that the return type in the JSON it is an integer. It's not a, a string. Uh, but if I were to just say send something that cannot be converted to an integer, I immediately get not just a, an error, but a specific error uh, object in the JSON that tells the users that they should be sending a valid integer, or the in this case, the front end uh, client that I expect an integer here. But if I ever wanted to accept anything, a, a string or something else, I can just change the type hint to take in a string. And in this case, then the item ID is a string and I can read and write it on the URL. So uh, that's that's very handy. But I think uh, this is a very simple case where you have a single parameter in the URL. But most of the time, what you have is a payload in your uh, body that you want to validate that it's uh, accepting the right thing. So for example, I have another demo here where I have this uh, Pydantic model. Pydantic is another Python library that uh, specializes in validating uh, data. So it's not specific to FastAPI, but it, it's hev uh, heavily leveraged by it. Uh, but you can see that I have this uh, item class and I have a name that should be a string. I have a description that should be a string also. And then I have a price that is going to be a float. Um, and then an optional uh, last update uh, timestamp in this case that by default is none, uh, but it can also be a, a, a timestamp. So if in the client, I make a post request uh, to this endpoint, which I have defined here, I'm just telling it that in the items route, it should expect a, a post request and then 
that is going to accept uh, an item instance. And I don't actually need to do anything to uh, parse the incoming JSON to make it fit into this class by just uh, declaring this dependency here, this parameter here as an item. I actually get full validation of the uh, of the incoming data, right? So in this case, I'm just reflecting it back with the updated uh, last update being calculated on the server, right? And this is what I get here on the on the client. So uh, if I were to, for example, change this and make it an integer, uh, that already fails validation and the client would get this error telling them exactly the location of the problem. So it's in the body, it's not in the, in, in the URL parameter, it's in the request body and it's actually in the name field and it should be a valid string and you pass a, a, an integer in this case. Um, so with that, it's very easy to create very well, uh, uh, or apps that can handle errors more gracefully, I think, with very little code. If you see, uh, it's very declarative. I like it a lot that I don't have to specify how to manually parse the uh, incoming requests and make it one of the, an instance of one of the models that I have defined. I can just tell it here in the, de declare it as, a, as an argument to the function, and then uh, FastAPI uh, make sure that I get just the, the right uh, class that I expect in my uh, function here. So yeah, that's the uh, one of the one of the things that I think make it stand out. The fact that you can le really leverage the Python type hints when writing your your path operations. That's really slick. I haven't seen this part of it, and yeah, that that just works really well. Yeah, it saves, and this is where the fast part really I think comes alive of. Oh, so really, you, you can just define that class. And and this is pretty trivial, uh, by the way, but you can get into some really complicated validation without really uh, having to deal with individual type conversions and everything. So PyDantic also is a, a great uh, library for doing validation of pretty much anything into anything. Yeah. So it allows, allows you to do things like um, if you want to accept a string or an integer for um, something and then cast that string into an ID? Does it, um, I guess it would. Yeah, so for example, the name here, I can say, uh, I can just use a union type here and yeah. this would let it accept to, I think the Python version I'm, I'm using doesn't have this syntax, but in your Python versions, you can just union whatever types you want and it's okay. gonna let you accept any of those. And then it also has additional logic that it calls validators where you can uh, tell it, expect it to ac accept anything. And as long as it passes this function and returns this, then it's good to go. And at that point, you can implement whatever logic you want for any given field. I, I think the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, the, so just this is already a huge time saver. You don't have to mess around with parsing requests or, or preparing your response to be serialized to JSON. You can just operate in the classes that you uh, want to work with. Um, but the other nice thing about this is that uh, without doing anything else, this is literally the entirety of the code that I have written here, you get this openapi.json endpoint, and that's gonna let you uh, get a full schema of all the objects that you have in your API. So if I send the request there, uh, I get this endpoint that completely uh, defines the all the, the endpoints in my API. So I see the first one here, the items slash item ID. And I can see that in the path, I'm expecting an item ID parameter. It is required. It should be of type string. Uh, and then it even documents the responses, right? So in, in the case of when a successful response happens, I'm getting a 200 response code. The response doesn't have any specific schema. Or if validation fails, it already documents uh, the 422 return code and it has its own schema that's going to be below in the in in this file uh, telling you exactly how you can read those errors and do something with it here's the other the other endpoint the items where it says the only valid method is post uh, it tells me that th in this case it expects uh, a body that's going to be JSON and it has a specific schema the item schema that the the request should comply with and it also tells me that uh, there's a response here and uh, uh, and also there could be validation errors. 
And if we go back, you can see the actual schema. So there's a schema for HTTP validation errors. There's another one. Here's the one for the item. So you can see it's already clearly documented that I inspected a, a name of type string. I'm inspecting a description of also a string. The price should be a number. The last updated could be any of a string formatted as a datetime, or it could be null. Um, and then it tells me here which of the fields are required. And this is the last schema for any validations errors. You can expect uh, any of these fields to be populated, telling you exactly the location of your errors. So that's also pretty handy, though the JSON can be pretty cumbersome to consume as a human. So where it really shines, I think, is uh, as automatic documentation, because FastAPI will also take in this uh, schema generated here and is going to create uh, this slash docs endpoint in your uh, server. So you can see the two uh, endpoints that I have here already documented. Uh, you can see the method that is allowed. You can see all the schemas as well that I have uh, defined and, or that we had in the JSON. But this is a completely human readable and browsable uh, documentation site where you can see, oh, okay, so this one in the case of the path, it expects a item ID uh, required parameter, which should be an integer. And then for responses, I can either get a 200 response code uh, returning uh, a string, or it could be a 422 validation error. And then the same with the item create, right? I, it tells me there's no parameters in this in the URL, but your request body should uh, implement this shape. And you can get uh, a 200 back, or you could get a validation error back as well. So just that it's super useful to have as a automatic living documentation site that you don't need to manually update. You can be sure that your schema is always up to date. Uh, in fact, I think if I just change here, for example, and make this accept uh, the integer again, I think it, that was already that. So refresh. Yeah, it now tells me that item ID is a string, right? So the the documentation is always up to date by by just changing one of the type hints. You get the schema, the open API, the JSON file, and the documentation already updated um, that way. And then the last thing I think, which is the cherry on top, I would say, uh, I don't have a demo for this, but going to the official documentation, there is this concept of open API client generator. So because open API is not a standard invented by fast API, it's actually a, an open standard. Uh, then it means that there's a bunch of different tools that can generate these JSON schemas. And there's, there's a bunch also that can consume them and do things with them. Uh, one of them is generating documentation, but then there's also other tools that taking the schema and generate full uh, and, and generate code with it. So in this case, uh, we want to generate a client, right? So it means uh, uh, a lightweight uh, JavaScript uh, framework or mini, yeah, mini library that you can run in the browser uh, that implements all the uh, schemas that OpenAPI is outputting. So in this case. Um, they, they have a different set of uh, models here, uh, but the idea is that you you get your API documents as uh, documentation as we as we saw right now, but then you can also install a tool like OpenAPI TypeScript uh, CodeGen. You install that as part of your front end dependencies, and then you will want to add it into your uh, npm scripts. So in this case, you just tell it where the OpenAPI JSON file is. So that's the one that's being served by, by FastAPI. And then you can generate the client. And this is going to create here the in, in your source folder, in the client folder, is going to create a all the code required to interface with the API. So why would you want to do that instead of writing your own uh, client logic? So when you're editing, for example, your uh, front end code, you get this default service uh, from the generated uh, folder. And then you get documentation for anything you can do with it, right? So here you start typing create and it tells you, oh, there's a create item there that you can go ahead and use. Let's say you you click into that and it documents the the uh, the objects, the, the keys that it expects in the in the in the request object, right? So oh, so if I want to create an item, I can see I, I need to uh, populate a name and a price. And then even going forward, you can 
going ahead of that, if you just send an empty uh, request, it tells you already that, oh, you're missing required uh, parameters there. The API is not going to like that. Um, and then assuming you get a response, then you also get documentation or autocomplete on what to expect from the response. So, oh, the response from the create item is going to have a message property that I can read or do something to display it in the UI or whatever. Um, and that's going to be, that's already a huge time series. In, in fact, I think we are already using some of that in an internal project. And I want to ask you, James, how if you think things like these are useful when you're authoring your, your front end uh, code as well. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. I think it's, I, I just love that the documentation, uh, the open API is just incorporated with this. It's, it's not a um, afterthought or something like that. It's just something that comes along with it. It's, you know, I've seen my fair share of APIs where I've had to guess or just start hitting endpoints to see what might be there um, and guess what, you know, um, what, what things are, what, yeah, what all might be there. Um, and then even if the API docs exist, it's probably just the happy path, just the success messages, um, and maybe just the inputs and not the results, all of those things. Um, so yeah, it's it's really very valuable to know what those things are. Um, and then having it having it output open API and with the code gen, um, yeah, it's it it uh, it simplifies a lot of the um, the logic. I, I'm not having to write a lot of boilerplate about okay, what's the path for this specific endpoint. Um, it's building that into the, this uh, like a function I can call. Um, it's in, uh, abstracting a lot of that out, so I don't have to think about um, about exactly or about the different paths or how to manage paths. Um, it's just kind of generated for me, uh, and it also really makes it easy to. Um, uh, to have changes, uh, APIs change, and it's it's always kind of I, I think it's a really uh, interesting kind of process question. How do you track those changes from um, from back end into where all they are, uh, where all this is implemented, um, and that really gets tricky when it's multiple code bases, um, maybe hitting or multiple th tools hitting a shared U uh, API, um, but with something like this. I, I think Ed, you've you've seen times where you've made a change to the the Open API or to the Fast API um, API. You just added a parameter or removed something or changed something, and then you were able to really quickly go through and you know with uh, TypeScript type checking in the uh, in our front end client, just be like, oh, okay, we need to change these five places. This is where we're using this field that we're not we don't have anymore, um, and it just simplifies that um, a lot. I, I really, really liked having that experience. This is mainly for for Ed, but I guess James, you can weigh, on, weigh in on this too, but what have been some of the challenges of using Fast API? Yeah, so my main experience and, and where I've been working with years and years is with Django, which is, which is another uh, Python framework. Um, and one of the key uh, advantages of Django is that it's its low slogan is better every every battery is included so its battery is included the whole time so you get everything that you could ever need to build a, a web application including database layers form validation um, static media assets uh, handling and just so much so many of other things fast API is really mo a, a more what some people might call a micro framework or a very specialized uh, unopinionated uh, framework. So it really lets you do whatever you want to talk to your database and to just do a bunch of the things that Django already does for you. So in, in this case, the recommended thing that most people are using is SQL Alchemy, with this, which is a standalone Python uh, ORM. But um, it is super mature, it's super capable, it's well documented. Uh, but it's it was an extra thing that I needed to learn. So if you're used to your framework telling you how to do requests and responses and also doing the database for you or having a, a, a correct way of doing it, then FastAPI is much less opinionated in that, in that sense. Um, then the other thing that I kind of missed of, from Django is the automatic uh, admin site. So in Django, 
just like you can do here in, in Fast API, in, in Django, the cases for models, you can get an entire uh, CRUD application for your admins where you can add and edit uh, and delete uh, objects and filter them and just do so many things. And there are a couple alternatives for Fast API, but none of them are as powerful or as polished as, as Django's admin site. Um, and then the last thing I think is the ecosystem. So Django has been around for so long that there's a package for pretty much anything you want to do. A lot of them are not maintained, but uh, yeah, yeah, there's just so many things, authentication, third-party integrations, uh, different uh, storage backends, just all, all kinds of things. Uh, somebody has probably already written the Django package for it. And FastAPI is not as big and not as old. So there's still a lot of do it yourself or, or glue things together in your own project uh, because there's not a mature ecosystem around it. So uh, I think those those are the the main things that come to mind uh, mm. working with Fast API. Okay. And Ed, based on your experience, would you recommend Fast API to another backend developer? Yeah. Yeah, I think the developer experience. Uh, on the back end is great, but then that type safety all the way all the way from the back of the server to the front of the client, that's really the, the killer feature. So yeah, I definitely recommend it and think it's a great choice for building APIs. Yeah. Are there cases where you wouldn't recommend it? Yeah, I think if your site is not a single page application, um, which I think more sites shouldn't be single page applications, uh, but that's a separate, <laughs> a separate topic. But if you have decided that actually we don't need to have a JSON API and and have uh, you know a view or React or Spell front end or whatever, um, then I would definitely go with Django because things like uh, the admin side and form processing and user authentication and a mature template language, those things are not. They're not absolutely. They're absolutely useful and and uh, required on on this kind of project. So, if yeah, if you don't need an API and 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 uh, you feel like you would be forcing the project if you were to go with that single page application route, I would probably not use a fast API. It's good to know. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ed, for sharing uh, that demo and telling us a bit more about fast API. Please visit adbird.net slash winging it to access links and resources mentioned on today's show or to send us feedback and topic requests or tell us how you keep your documentation up to date and relevant. On the next winging it, we will discuss how to use a JavaScript proxy as your store. If you'd like to support us, please like and subscribe. And if you want more from Oddbird, we invite you to check out our newsletter at oddbird.net slash oddnews. Thank you. And remember, best practice is a conversation. So let's keep talking.